It was the most desperate hour for Sabaton history. And then, the winged hussars arrive! Contemporary spectators of the late 16th century wholeheartedly agreed that they had never seen such fine cavalry before, nor could they indeed compare such splendor to anything else in Europe at the time. On magnificent parade grounds, the Polish kings displayed the grandeur of their hussars. Clad in highly decorated Karatsena armor, with saddles and reins embroidered in gold and precious stones, they rode the finest breeds of horses, donning costumes made of the skins of tigers, leopards, and wolves. They held long lances with large colorful pennants at the tips, and to top it all off, an awe-inspiring pair of wings that arched from the end of their saddles over their heads, fluttered proudly in the wind. It is no wonder that so many romantic tales and a wide array of both true and fictitious legends had been spread around the courts of Europe of these men. The character of the Polish winged hussars was in fact a complex hybrid of Western and Eastern culture, coming from the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth, geographically the largest country in Europe at the time, originating in the heavily armored knights of the region in medieval times. They incorporated influences from Russia, the Byzantine Empire, and Mongol cavalry initially, and later from the Balkans and the Ottoman Empire. The influence from Serbian and Hungarian refugees settling there in the wake of the expanding Ottoman Empire began strongly influencing Polish cavalry in the 16th century. Polish noblemen began creating the new heavy hussar, who was equipped with male shirts, large helmets, the typical Balkan shields, and long lances. The Transylvanian king, Stefan Batory, further standardized the hussars, ordering them to drop the shield in favor of a thick breastplate. The new heavy hussars indeed became units with which to be reckoned. On the battlefield against the Habsburgs, Moldovans, Muscovites, and Swedes, Polish hussars achieved great triumphs over their enemies. However, by the 17th century, the winged hussars seemed to be more a product of a bygone age. Most European nations began abandoning the heavy lancers in favor of pike and firearm formations and a mix of various cavalry units. The experience of the Thirty Years' War showed that a new era of massed firepower, like the Swedish brigades of Gustav Adolf, easily countered the direct charge of the Lancers. Was this the end of the Polish winged hussars? The Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth faced crisis after crisis, fighting invasions from the east, from Tartars and Ukrainian Cossacks, who destroyed many Polish regiments. It seemed like the winged hussars were doomed to the dustbin of history. Crown Hetman and later King Jan III Sobieski, however, thought differently. In the face of the re-emerging threat of the Ottoman Empire's expansion from the Balkans into the heart of Europe, new hussar regiments were to be raised, reviving the spirit of the winged hussars once more. Sobieski called upon all worthy sons of Poland, urging patriotic nobles to voluntarily fight against the Ottoman menace and raise their own troop. The state, in fact, contributed very little in reality, and the noblemen and local leaders had to cover most of the expenses themselves. It was advertised as a career investment, though. See, they provided horses, armor, and weapons, and they would serve the king in campaign, and in turn, were supposed to recover their investment with war booty and lucrative state offices granted by the monarchy. The men accepted into hussars would make a contract where it would take them up to two and a half years to pay off their arms and weapons. And if they survived that long, they would earn themselves money and prestige. It was a complex, flawed system, but for the time it worked. The typical hussars were large protective helmets, often embellished with ostrich feathers. They were equipped with Hungarian-style sabers or Polish straight swords and protected by a lobster-style breastplate engraved with religious imagery. Now, everyone is, of course, more interested in the history of the wings. Historians still argue, though, about the exact use of the wings. By the 17th century, they were usually mounted on the back of the saddle, but the argument 
is whether they were actually worn in battle or were just for show, like the embroidered saddles and decorated swords, or the expensive bows which were in turn exchanged for wheel-lock pistols when on campaign. Sadly, we are missing contemporary battle accounts in that regard. But historians in favor of the battlefield theory emphasize that the wings were carried like the leopard skins into battle to frighten not just the enemy, but also their horses, easily affected by unusual sights. They would come down on their enemies like predatory pegasi. Humor me, okay? Predatory pegasi. That's what they did. The actual important symbol of the Polish hussar in the field, however, was his lance. Over five meters long, 16 feet, the Polish lance was clearly a one-use weapon. It was made out of light wood, usually pine or fir, and hollowed in parts to make it even lighter. This was fitting for the hussar style of fighting. It was often said that the hussars were only good for one day of fighting, but that one day would be the decisive one. And such a day came in the year 1683. In July, the Ottoman army had once again marched northwards, threatening the Habsburg realms and the city of Vienna. An estimated 170,000 Ottoman troops lay siege to Vienna, easily outnumbering the mere 16,000 regular defenders. But despite the clear disparity of forces, the Viennese defenders held out, defying the Ottoman guns for weeks. That heroic last stand, however, could not last forever, as food supplies and the strength of the defending soldiers and citizens began to run out. On the 6th of September, Sobieski crossed the Danube north of Vienna with a force 20,000 strong. He would honor his promise to the Holy League to fight the Ottoman menace once more. At the same time, a large Holy Roman Imperial force under Charles of Lorraine was marching south as well. They would unite their forces under the command of the Polish king. And among his men marched the Polish winged hussars. By this time, Ottoman sappers had come dangerously close to opening up a breach for the Ottoman troops to take the city by storm. Digging tunnels beneath the walls and filling them with explosives was quite literally a burning fuse under the city. The Ottomans would eventually be successful, despite the valiant resistance of Vienna's inhabitants, and it seemed their fate was already decided. But then, one day, on the far off horizon, the winged hussars arrived. And the winged hussars arrived. Coming down the mountainside. And the winged hussars arrived. Coming down the tide. On September 12th, King Jan Sobieski and his winged hussars came to the relief of the besieged city. The battle had begun the day before and the troops of Charles of Lorraine were already punching hard into the Ottoman lines. The Ottomans launched several counterattacks, though, preventing the Imperials from breaking through. Ottoman sappers hurriedly were filling new tunnels with explosives, trying to blow the walls, but at the last minute, these were found and destroyed by the Viennese defenders. The next day, as the Polish infantry joined the Imperials, the winged hussars moved through the cover of the woods, approaching the main Turkish redoubt. Preparing for the decisive strike, the deeply Catholic hussars held a holy mass, steeled themselves with prayer, and their traditional battle hymn, Bogorodzica, Mother of God. By four in the afternoon, together with a group of imperial horsemen, the Polish cavalry stormed down the hill. In all, they were 18,000 strong, probably the largest cavalry charge in European history. Sobieski personally led the attack at the head of his winged hussars. At about 100 paces, the real charge began. At 50 paces, their horses were driven to full gallop as the winged hussars lowered their lances and smashed into the terrified defenders. Lances splintered, horses trampled men beneath them, soldiers were crushed and thrown aside. The sight of impaled men before them terrified the men in the rearward units and their morale crumbled. Most of the Ottoman troops were not protected by plate armor and their formations broke apart. Some winged hussars dropped their broken lances and reached for the swords and sabers that hung from knots at their wrists. Others took up war hammers or pistols as they drove through the disordered enemy to safety. 
they regrouped for another charge, wave after wave into the Ottoman troops as more troops of the Holy League joined the battle. Vespasian Koshavsky in his Song of Vienna Liberated describes it so, no sooner does a hussar lower his lance than a Turk is impaled on its spike, which not only disorders, but terrifies the foe. That blow, which cannot be defended against or deflected, oft transfixing two persons at a time, others flee in eager haste from such sight, like flies in a frenzy. After their decisive victory in the Battle of Vienna, the fame of the Polish hussars grew once more throughout Europe. The Holy Roman Emperor personally invited them to his court for a demonstration of their skills. And the Russian Tsar raised his own thousand-strong hussar army under a Polish renegade. Vienna, however, despite being one of the greatest ones, would also be one of the last victories the hussars achieved. Soon afterward, the Commonwealth, under pressure both from foreign powers and from within, started coming apart. The huge costs of defensive wars contributed to a general financial decline. There were rebellions, and it was, it was hard to really afford the expensive hussars anymore. Nonetheless, the winged hussars managed to survive well into the 18th century and would be deployed in the Great Northern War. But their decisive role on the battlefield lay behind them. Their imagery, however, survived and especially in the 19th century, began to re-emerge as a symbol of Polish pride and identity, remembering them from a time when indeed no finer cavalry than the Polish winged hussars roamed the battlefields of Europe. The Winged Hussars arrive. This is the most requested song of all so far. So for far this. for the Sabbath on History since we started. Yep. Yeah. And and this week actually, it's not this today, but this week actually is one year since the channel premiered last yeah. February, last February seventh. What you wanted the most, we saved for the one year anniversary. How many Winged Hussar memes do you think that guess how many Sabaton Winged Hussars memes there have been over the over the ages? Uh, ages. Ages. <laughs> <laughs> There's a lot of Sabaton memes about this because it's so easy. Like, you can do whatever. Like, you say, uh, I was just out walking my dog. And, and then, then the Winged Hussars, hussars arrive. arrive! So there is always an uh, opportunity for the Winged Hussars to arrive <laughs> in your life. Do you know how the meme started or, or how... In I think it's just because of the song. Yeah. I mean, we, we were like, uh, when we were working on writing the song and the lyrics, we had this... Da -da 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 -da. You know, it's like, <coughs> that is so clear for... It. Then the Winged Hussars arrive. Yeah. And it was just when we, when we wrote it, it was... Uh, Damn, this is so perfect. This is the catchiest moment of the album. Uh, you know, it's interesting because uh, we're filming this just after the Sabaton Cruise. So this is still 2019 when we're filming this and you're seeing this in the future. Cool. Um, I like that you did two completely different sets. That's, uh, cruise, that was really yeah. cool. That's, uh, that's uh, really something for the I, fans. I mean, uh, on the Sabaton Cruise, we are we always try to do something special because we don't have any big stages there. Yeah. We like, we can't use any pyrotechnical effects or anything because it's a it's a ship. It's a uh, and it's a quite small stage and very intimate with the with the people that are fortunate enough to get a ticket in time because yeah. they sell out instantly. But when you were on the the ship and everything goes to hell, yeah. Then the wings. Then the wings. Are stars. Stars. They did. They totally <laughs> arrived, and it scared the crap out of us because. Suddenly, 18,000 guys on horses turned up, and we're on a boat. So, whoa, boy. They'd be everywhere. Yeah. And that's going to be a new meme when the 18,000 <laughs> winged hussars arrive, arrive and we're on a took boat. <laughs> the Sabaton cruise. I took the Sabaton cruise. Like, uh, hussars, party of 18,000, your table's ready. Hussars. Nope, the winged hussars have not yet arrived. But see they will. I, see what I did there? <laughs> All, All right. right, this was a pretty funny episode, yeah. but it is a great song and it's yeah. a great story. Yeah. And, uh, uh, and the meme's brilliant. It is a great <laughs> the, meme. Too. Yeah, the memes have created the legend of the song now. Well, thank you for today and thanks for one year of Sabaton history. Yes, thank you. And uh, please remain supporting it because we want to continue for yeah. much longer time. You see, we really enjoy doing that. Yeah. All right, see you next time. See you.
everybody thank you for watching this week's episode and don't forget to subscribe become patreon and click the little bells and everything else that you need to do to become a fully supporter of this channel thank you for your support